This is the Cosmwasm introduction using Spawn, where we're actually going to be building an interoperable name service in Cosmwasm, and you can follow along with me here. The hardest part of setting up Spawn is actually setting up your just local development environment. Uh, follow this link. There is going to be a thing. I will give you time to set this up on your laptops. You need basic tools like Go, Git, and then Rust installed for this tutorial. We have this here for Windows, WSL, uh, Mac OS, and Linux. You can just go in there, any tools that you don't have, copy paste it into your tutorial if, or into your terminal. If you have any issues at all, raise your hand. I will help you debug things. There's also a debug section in the, the tutorials here that walks you through common error cases like forgetting to locate or forgetting to start your Docker engine or other things like that. While you install that, I'm going to ramble on about what we're going to be doing today while you spend that time there. Again, raise your hands at any point if you have any issues. I'm Reese. I'm a developer experience and protocol engineer at Strangelove, and I solve key pain points where engineers face problems building up blockchain applications. A lot of the difficult of setting things up, understanding it, and helping others solve issues is where my core focus is, and that includes building up tooling and building up documentation and tutorials for the interchain and for users across the ecosystem. The problem that we're going to be solving today is that user addresses are very inconvenient. Uh, the user address is a unique characters used to send, receive, and interact with an application, and it's very complex in terms of its styling here. We can see the Ethereum, there's just a lot of random characters and numbers to average users. The same for Bitcoin, and it's also the same here for the interchain. The interchain is slightly better because we have these prefixes at the start that specifies where that network is, uh, like Noble or Akash, that we at least have some context here versus just being an arbitrary address. With this though, we need to make this more readable and we want this to be done in IBC. We need to, as mentioned, we need to, a solution to link this address to be human readable. Uh, this is where a name service comes into play. A name service is a centralized store of information that users and applications can communicate with some data. Uh, a good example of something like this is DNS, where instead of actually typing in one of those uh, IPs, 8.8.8, .8 into your browser, you could just type in like dns.google and it'll redirect you to where that is, but it's human readable to you. We want to do the same thing with a normal user address. Uh, the issue with this though, is that name services are very centralized in this aspect, where if one party has all of the information, who's to say that they won't change something? Uh, with this, we need a, an interoperable solution where we can save it across multiple multiple different parties at the same time. That way you can verify from multiple sources, is this the source of truth? And only the user that owns that address can actually submit that. And we'll be doing that today in Cosmosm. Uh, let's head over into the docs. As mentioned, the installation docs, there's a system setup. You can go through this. It gives you the basics of how to actually install it for Windows. This does require WSL. Mac OS using Brew, and then Linux. For this, you'll also need Cosm Wasm, so you'll need some, some Rust things, including the Wasm runtime target. Once you have all of those installed, there is an install spawn from source. You, what you'll do is you'll get cloned this, and this just grabs the latest values, and then you'll make install on this. This will install spawn to your repository, that way you can actually create these new chains. The next feature that we're working on is to actually put all of this in the browser where you won't have to set up your development environment at all. You'll just go to a website and in that website, you're just going to be able to specify all of the features that we're about to do and you don't have to set up anything. It'll be super nice, super convenient. We're not there yet, but as of now, for most developers, this is great. Local Interchain is our testnet environment runner. This testnet runner allows you to run chains locally or up in the cloud in something like Hetzner and launch either public test nets or a mainnet if you decided to uh, through this. It makes it super convenient to launch extremely complex setups like running multiple versions of this chain and then connecting a relayer between that without having to set up all of the hassle of setting up a relayer, setting up these uh, other chains, building across multiple different ports and all of those features. Highliner is our Docker container tool. This is similar to local interchain, but we do it for building up arbitrary Docker images where you can go to a brand new chain that's, that's never existed before, for example, the one that you've created, and just be able to build up a new network from that for the, the Docker images. 
one of the most common problems with setting up your environment is the forgetting of, of modifying your path. Uh, the path is where binaries are stored, and a lot of times you'll install something, it moves to a place that your system is not aware of. Uh, and so with this, we can test here in the install spawn. We try to really make the developer experience great. we verify that these were installed correctly. And if not, here are some common reasons that they may not be installed based off of, of your path here. In debugging, we go through multiple different areas of things that may have been found, like, hey, go is not found. There's reasons why. Typically, it's with path, um, and we have other things for like Windows and WSL, depending on, on what you see and how to, to resolve those issues that we've seen in production live with other people's machines. The most common one is Docker not running. With this, we specify how to do that in Linux, as well as how to do it in other networks and other common issues that you may find. We may get to actually running this on a, like we're gonna rebuild this up in both Cosmosm and on a, a standard SDK chain. We're gonna see based off of timing how many chains we can do. For now, we're gonna start on Cosmosm and, and make sure we get that out of the way. And then we'll move back to this if we can to showcase how it's done in the SDK and the other complexities that you see there. In the rollchains.github.io slash spawn docs, there is this part three called IBC contract, which is where we're gonna be starting. While this is part three, it's just a, an extension of the previous parts, but we'll be creating a new chain here with Cosmosm installed using Spawn. There are the prerequisites here, so anything you did forget, you can go back to that, including Rust and Cosmosm. And now we're actually going to begin to start building up our new chain. The first thing we're gonna do is set our GitHub username. This should be what is, is applicable to you. You can also just use the default here if you don't plan on uploading it. We're gonna use the spawn new command and we're gonna create a new chain called CW chain, which stands for Cosmosm. We're gonna set it as a proof of stake consensus. We're going to use a wallet prefix as we saw earlier with Noble and, and Akash. We're going to use role. For the DNOM, we're going to use uroll. For the binary name, it will be role D. This is like as you type in the word spawn and it finds that, it'll be role D and it finds that. Uh, we're gonna disable the block explorer. This just clones down a ping pub thing. We don't, we don't want that. By default, everything else is enabled, so Cosmosm will be enabled through spawn, and then we're going to modify into that. So let's head over into a terminal. I'm gonna head to the desktop, and then I'm gonna run this where I put that in, and then I also run the spawn new chain. As this happens, spawn's going to go through and generate everything for you, and just like that, we already have a chain, and it's got Cosmosm ready to go. Everything is set up for you, including testing, GitHub integrations, and all of the scripts that you need to run, which depend on some of those features that you installed earlier with the spawn script. With this, you can also just straight up upload this to GitHub. So we're going to use the GitHub here. We're gonna paste this, and I can now just upload that to my GitHub if I decided to. Uh, we did skip Git, so we're going to continue. Actually, ran CW chain, and then you run that, and that will upload to there. In here, we're going to run GoMod tidy just to verify that everything did indeed work. Sometimes on some different Wi-Fi networks, it may not install everything. This just verifies, hey, you do have everything locally on your machine. There were no issues. The next step though, we have a Cosmosm chain. We're not gonna do any development on that yet. We're going to start on actually building up a, the Cosmosm contract. This is going to use the cargo generate command. It's going to reference the CW template repo built by the Confio team. And the point of it is just to give you a baseline of where you want to start. We're going to name it the name service contract. You can name it whatever you would like. We're going to then give the minimal version and we're going to use an older version of Cosmosm that works with this um, the spawn repo. As future versions of spawn come out, we'll update this to, to be the latest for you. You're gonna copy this into your terminal. And this is then going to generate it within the CW chain area. And just like that, you have that contract. In here, it's gonna give you other useful information, like it'd be if you're using VS Code to install the Rust Analyzer or even better Toml, just to have a better editing experience as you're building up your contracts. We're gonna head over into VS Code into this name service contract now. I have done light mode for you, so it is easier to read. This is a standard Cosmosm repository based off of that, that template, and it's built in Rust, and you're able to see all of the files here, such as the different contracts, the errors, 
the different messages that you would execute into this, and then also state where we're going to store specific information to this name service. So we can close out of this other terminal and head back into the docs. The first thing we need to do is to update the contract to actually allow for IVC capabilities. You're going to modify these three files that are found in the cargo toml and then update them to make sure that we have the capabilities in Cosmosm standard. Oh, yes. Um, I don't know if it's going to Okay. Got it. Yeah, got it. Let me let me put this in and then I'll take a minute to explain some other things. What this IBC3 does is it allow for IBC connectivity between different contracts. We're going to use the same contract on multiple different chains. The relayer is then going to connect those between. By allowing that, we can set data on one contract and also set it on another via an IBC packet, and now we could verify against both chains. In this tutorial, we're just going to set it to the other side, but you could just as easily do some logic on this contract first and then create that packet and do those sorts of things. So. The contract here is going to allow us to set that name service and fulfill our needs here. Are there any questions on those things while people have their things compiling and generating? Cargo generate. Let's see if debugging live. Why can I not? That is good to know. Yes, you need to do a cargo install on cargo generate. That is a good thing for me to add to the docs. I will add that into the spawn thing and have that fixed later today. Is there then was it added here in the readme? Yeah, here it is. Uh, that that's run script. Great, yeah. Increasing, okay, awesome. Are you guys at the cargo generate? Is that what's taking the time or is it the installing of spawn? Got it, yeah, okay. Uh, we are looking at in integrating where Go packages will be compiled with Spawn for this exact reason, where every single core component of Spawn, we're going to have that in there, and then we're going to move that from the Spawn binary into your cache. That way you could be like on an airplane, like, oh, I forgot to install those Go dependencies before, and you'll just have them there natively because we have everything at the start of Spawn. Uh, we're really trying to improve UX across the board for all of the Spawn components. Yes. Okay. Um, what we'll do is while we wait, we will head over into the other instance. And we'll discuss this application. So one of the things with Spawn, as I mentioned, was that we set up all of these workflows for you with a new chain. Whenever you release an image, we're going to compile a Docker image for you, and then you're going to have that in your GHCR, which allows for other people to just pull those Docker instances. One of the big core focuses of Spawn is we've generated this chain, but how do I actually verify that any of it works? Like we can't really trust that. And the way we do trust that is that we allow for instant testing of actual integration uh, across all of the different components that you set and features that you desired to have. If you wanted Cosmosm, we have a Cosmosm test that will then run as you upload that to GitHub. We will actually go look at that if I go into my repositories, where we upload this CW chain. This is private by default, and we can see these actions are running. What it's going to do is build that Docker image every time you push up new code, and then run this against every single interchain test, which we'll look at in just a minute. We do some other verifications. Um, we also release the binary, so we release the Docker image, but we do release the binary as well. That way that others can just download this directly. If you're a validator, you don't want to set up Go. I just want the binary so I can run it. As mentioned earlier as well, the testnet for Hetzner, we have an instance here. It gives some examples of what you need to input, what you need to modify in your repository. That way, as you release new versions of this instance, you'll get uh, an actual server that you can interact with and have a public testnet with in a very quick and painless way that you use the GitHub UI entirely for. 
Then finally, we just test, does everything in the application compile with the unit test and actually run? With local interchain, we made it as simple as possible where you just have to write JSON. So we have this CW chain, we have this local chain, one is what we're gonna call it, and we have all of the Genesis modifications for how we want to make it fast since it's local and it's not a production environment. And then we have some accounts that are pre-filled with information for you. And these accounts allow for uh, you to interact with the network and already have accounts funded to just continue on. That way you don't have to deal with fees. You can override config files if there's specific information you need for some weird edge case, you can specify that. And any features here that you don't need, you can just remove entirely from the config and it will give you some sane defaults. Uh, we connect these multiple chains together. One of the big things is how do we make it easy to specify that I have one local interchain instance and I wanna connect that to another chain. You just have to input this, this array. You just input what are the chain, uh, the chain names. So local chain one, I wanna to connect to local chain two. And on local chain two, I'll specify the same thing and it will know to link up those two together because it's uh, the same values. We're gonna have one validator run because we don't need multiple. If you're testing determinism, you should run more, but for a testing environment with Cosmosm, we're going to assume that it is uh, deterministic and you're fine to just run with one. We have some other specified values that we um, had by default whenever we created the network. We use two second blocks. You can make this as fast as you want. For this, it's overkill to do something like that. That just helps the relayer pass data faster. Uh, host, port, host port overrides allow for you to specify that you want the Docker container for the main one to go to certain ports on this. Uh, if you have multiple nodes, it's going to give you randomized ports, but sometimes it's nice to just always have the same ports for the same network, and you can do that here. That way, as you spin it up, it's ready to go. And then this is empty as we're not using ICS. Local chain two is the exact same case. Uh, it's just now local chain two, similar accounts. All of these will be added to our key ring later. That way you have full access. You don't have to copy paste anything here. For this with interchain tests, we have a basic test that's generated for you and it just verifies, hey, some balance is there. It's very, very basic given the name. Cosmosm is going to actually upload contracts and verify against them with execution and querying. And I believe somewhere we also check sub messages and other values that may be in the conformance testing suite where we test other things that have we've seen go wrong in production before and you're verified where if you write something incorrectly, we'll catch that for you and um, by default. We have IBC rate limiting where it verifies that within a certain period of time, not too many funds come out of out of the network. We make sure that all this all of that is set up. We do the same for just normal IBC testing. We do it for packet forward middleware as we didn't disable this, it does that too. And we have token factory installed as well. We test all of these to make sure they're all working as expected as a user would want. And you don't have to set up any of it, it's just done for you. Then you can just write further tests for any custom logic that you write on top. We have basic scripts. Um, one of the big one is test node, where if you don't want to deal with, with optimizing a Docker image and having to set up all of that and, and run it, you can also just run this test node instance. We give you some values here, and this will just build the chain and run it very quickly locally. What I'll do here is I'll just run make sh testnet, and we'll just see how, yes, indeed, this, this network does run. It's going to build that up. It'll install it. It's then going to take those, those keys that we found in local interchain and add them to us. We already have it, so it'll show an error, but it'll continue on. For you, the first time that you do it, it'll be proper. Uh, and then it's just gonna start a network and start producing blocks. And right there, we had block one and blocks will continue to go. And again, you can update how fast you want it by updating this block time. Uh, if you wanted five millisecond blocks, you can do that uh, for local development. Are others still installing and downloading Go binaries or are we good? Good. Awesome. We'll head back over into the contract then. Okay, we now have the chain. We've shown that it's running. We've proved that out. We've now generated this chain using cargo generate and it's, it's grabbed that template. And then we've opened that up into VS code. In the VS code, we're gonna modify that cargo toml again to add the IBC support. 
you modify that here with these lines on 37 to 41. And in this dependency section, we're going to come in here and we're going to run cargo update just to verify that everything is installed. So there are some more installation things that need to be done once that is set up. And that is the cargo update command. While you wait for that, we can continue on to the next sections where we're going to start adding code into the contracts and, and walking through what is actually is, is happening. In the top right of the different sections, there is a little copy button. You can just copy that and then head back to the contract. And we're going to paste that into the state.rs file. This is where the actual storage uh, mechanism is. This is within the source. My copy is not working. We import two of the, the core libraries here. We then have this new type called wallet mapping. This is just for us. You could also just use this in the sections where you see wallet mapping. Just imagine it as an alias. We're going to have this new wallet mapping, which is just going to create a blank empty wallet. As we're connecting with IVC, if there's not an IVC channel, we should just create a new empty one and then we'll set users. And then the last thing is actually where we save it to storage, which is this name service string here, which is going to be a map that is called name service. You can name this whatever you want, but this is what we have gone for this tutorial. And that's all that's needed for actually storing things to the state. Uh, the contract will set some values in a later logic. Now that the state is set up, we actually need to interact with it in some way. This means setting a name, being able to retrieve a name from a contract, and then also what we need specifically for IBC. Just like before, you can come up here and just press copy and override this within the message RS. I'm going to do it manually. For the user, they want to execute. So we head over to message. In the execute message area, we're then going to just set name where they're going to specify a channel. Imagine this as any other chain that, that is connected that has this contract and what name that they want to set on them. For this, they'll be able to set any name that they want. In some cases, you may only want them to set a unique ID where someone else that has set a name is not actually you know, reused. Uh, you can add that logic easily on this contract. In the query message, we're going to, we need a way to retrieve the name. We're going to retrieve it also from a channel because maybe they've set different names across different chains depending on, on what the, the use case is and then what that wallet is that we want for that. We head over to the query message and we just paste that in and there's this get name response that it's going to return. We need to also specify this, which is just going to specify what the name is to back to the user client. Then we have this IBC execute message, which is a new type that we've generated as an enum. And this is going to be the same as the previous set name, but we're going to send this as a packet across the network to the other network to then uh, decompile, look at it, understand it, and do some logic based off of it. So we call it set name. It has a wallet. It is a name. We'll be able to use it. Now in the contract, we're going to Import everything just so that way you're, if your editor doesn't fully load things in, you'll just be able to use that. So we're going to copy this into the top of the contract. Find where this long comment is. We can remove everything above that. And then paste this in. There will be a lot of, of shown errors. These will get fixed as we add in future logic. The next section is the contract instantiate. As we've uploaded a, a store code, which we'll see in just a minute, the instantiate is going to just run. We don't need to set any custom values. If we did, where maybe a user only wants a person to have one name that they, that they can set, you could write some state logic here to verify that. For this, we just don't want it to panic. So we're going to submit an OK response, which is just going to say that we ran the instantiate method. You could also just do a blank response. But for this, just as a nice debugging tip to add some extra attributes there. We're now going to move into where user execution happens. Uh, and these lines that are highlighted, we need to go this in the execute method. And we're going to replace those on lines 23 to 25. They're not used yet, and we're going to go through what all of this is. 
this is a match message and it's going to find messages that, that input it and it's going to sort it and find where that logic should be. Think of it as like a smart router for some function call and we only have one which is the execute set name. We're going to replace the unimplemented method with that and save it. Now there's a lot going on here. Whenever the user sets the name, this is found back in the message file where we have the execute message. We're going to set some attributes which are useful for debugging. You could also remove this if you wanted to simplify the, the look of this. And then we, we actually add this other message uh, via Cosmosm to do this send packet that we created, which is that new type which we specify, oh, this is actually in the Cosmosm standard library, and there's extra data here that we can implement, which will be the type that we created. We're going to set where that channel is. The user specified this in their message uh, as they wanted to set their name. I want to set it on channel zero, which could be chain zero. We, we're going to set that name there. We add the data as a binary representation of the execute message set name, which is where we generated here in the message.rs. And we're going to specify who is the name and who is this from. The info sender, and we just convert that to a string, is who it is from, which the user doesn't have to provide. The, the contract gives it to us through Cosmosm. We then specify this timeout. This timeout is based off of a timestamp where we grab the current block time. We add two minutes to it. That way, if it, it's not sent within that certain period of time, this contract, this um, request becomes void, the user needs to redo it, resubmit another transaction for some reason. And that's all that it, that it takes for setting the name here and submitting that IBC packet from the user. It's kind of like a wrapper where the user wants to set the name, but we're really under the hood actually creating that IBC packet for them using this add message functionality. Now we need to be able to retrieve this name. We're going to head over into the query area replace the unimplemented method, and paste this in. Some things you'll see say that they're not defined there. You don't modify the underscores in the message for message and depths. With this, we've got this query message. The user wants to get a name on a given channel. We're going to call into the name service state that we set earlier in the state.rs file, and we're going to see does it load using the may load, may load method. Because a channel that maybe was just created won't have any state yet, there's possibil a possibility that no user has set a name, and we need to verify that with that line. If there is, then we're going to check. Let's grab those wallets. And if there are those wallets, we're going to try to get the wallet that was requested here using the wallets.get method. If that was the case and there was a wallet and we found it, we can just return that data back to the user using this return here with sum. If there wasn't, then there was no name for set for the wallet. We just return none. And then if no channel was found in the previous if, uh, as you think about it that way, the, no, there was no channel found. No one's actually set a name here. We don't have any state for that. And that's a similar match message as the execute was. We're going to add this other section. Uh, this doesn't have to be here, but we are going to use it where a try set name. Uh, this is going to be used for IBC. And it's going to try to set the name, as the, the name suggests. And uh, we're going to just paste that in here. You can paste it anywhere within the contract. And we have where we read from the current state of this contract. And we're going to update it so that way, as a user specifies, I want to update my name to something else. They can. We just load the current wallets for the given channel. We insert the new wallet and what their name is. This will override previous instances. And then we just return that back to ourselves. That way, we can do any modifications with it, maybe based off of some name that is set or allowing other uh, verifications. We're now going to create a new file. This is called the ACK file. This is for acknowledgments. And this just has some boilerplate that we need for IBC to function properly. So using the touch command or just creating it, you can create it within the source directory. Open up my terminal here. I will paste that in. And we now have this ACK file. It's currently empty. And you're just going to copy paste in the information that is found here. You don't really have to know what this is. Just for now, know that we need to use it. You can look more into it based off of the link that is found. You will notice that this file, it is very grayed out. And it's because Rust actually doesn't have reference to be able to use this within the library. We're going to head back over here. And in the lib.rs file, we need to add 
the module for this and make sure that it's public so we can access it. So you'll head over into your lib.rs file and anywhere within here, paste in that you want to add the public mod ac. And our ac file is now not as grayed out and we can see it properly. We have a successful one, which just returns a one in binary. And then if it is a fail, it will return that error back to the, the user so the contract can properly handle it. The next section are the errors that we expect for, uh, if something goes wrong, what do we, what do we expect here? Uh, one thing is invalid version. This is something specific to IBC. Uh, you don't need to think too much about this, but in different ways, you can have logic where only one pack, like if one packet has to go first, the other packet has to follow that up. If this one gets stuck for some reason, no other packets can go. Uh, for us, we're not going to use that logic. So we just want to make sure that users don't you do that. Do that. We could leave that out and leave it up to the contract implementer, um, but we're going to, to keep things sane. And then order channels, just to make sure that, you know, we only use the unordered channels here. We also have this other type called never, and this is just so we never return back an error. It's just a nice to have in the for the verification and the IBC logic that we'll be writing later. You head over into the errors file, and we'll paste that within the contract error enum, and then we're going to do the same for never. And with that, our errors are implemented and we'll be able to use that in this new future logic. We now need to create another file. This is the ibc.rs file. And this is where we're gonna store all of the IBC specific logic. Open back up the terminal and we're gonna to touch that file. Again, the IBC file is going to be grayed out because it's not used. So we're going to just like the ACK, we're going to use IBC. And now this file is going to be able to be used by the contract. This is a fresh file. There's going to be a lot of code that is about to be shown. Uh, I'll quickly run through, through most of it. A lot of it though is boilerplate. Um, ideally in the future, we have a template that just has this for you and we would just have to write a couple of lines. Um, so this will get even, even easier than it is now. We're gonna copy paste all of this text here. This is going to import these statements. Um, by default, we wouldn't have to, but I wanted to make sure that people's editors don't have to, to think too much. Uh, we're gonna specify an IBC version. This is the specific protocol that we are going to design. We're calling this name service one. So we shortened it just to NS1. And any contract that wants to talk with this contract needs to have this as an identifier. That way that we know that they're speaking the same language together. We have a nice uh, validate order and version. This is probably overkill for what this, this uh, tutorial is doing, but we want to verify some of these things like making sure that it is an unordered channel, that uh, these versions do match up, and that the counterparty version does, does match as expected. It is also, we could just remove this entirely and just always assume that there is good intent, but we want to make sure that people that are following this know that you should uh, check, check for this, these values, especially in a production-based network. So we're going to copy all of this, including the macro and paste that into the IBC file. The next section is going to be for how do we handle as a new network connection is created or is attempting to be created. And then also what happens whenever we decide that we want to close out that connection for some reason uh, across the board. We have this, uh, this channel open and this is just gonna validate, hey, are we trying to open it against a contract that is actually valid for us to use? And if it is, great, we'll continue on. If not, we'll error out and tell the user, you can't connect an NS1 contract to an ICS20. Uh, they don't speak the same language. They won't know how to actually communicate. The channel close is just, if a channel is closed for some reason, uh, we will grab what that channel was. We're going to then remove that from the name service storage to save space because we no longer need it. And we'll just return some useful information back for why we did that. We're gonna just go copy paste that into the IBC RS file at the bottom. And now we have both of those methods implemented. Now we need to do about the connections where we mentioned earlier, if a new channel is created but no user has done anything yet, then we, we just have blank data. We need to set some values there into storage. That way that there is something that the user can interact with. This is done in the channel connect. 
we validate again, everything is expected. Um, we grab what channel it is, and then we save that to state with a new wallet mapping, which is just an empty area where we're gonna have the user's data. And then we return back some basic response information. Now, where the fun part comes is the IBC packet receive. When we receive a packet, we need to actually handle the logic for what we want to do, and that's going to be done here. And we're gonna copy this, and then I'll go over what exactly it's doing. Move this into the IBC file. And this IBC packet receive, this is a, a standard function that comes in. We're going to match on what the message was that came in for this IBC packet. Does it pertain to us? Um, is it the response okay? Is it handling all right? If not, we need to show why. Uh, we're going to call into this do IBC or packet. This is similar to that contract RS, the try to set name. It's very similar um, format in terms of that to just break it out. We're gonna grab where that channel is for, for where this packet's coming from. And then we're going to, to decode that, that packet data that we encoded before, now that way into the, the normal type so we can, can use type safety against it. We're gonna validate that this is a set, a set name, which has the wallet and name. We can go back and see that this was what we defined in the message.rs file. Um, it's the format that we expected and that put the user set. And then we try to set the name on them where we grab that channel, where they're from, uh, what their wallet is, and what the name is that they wanted to set on this other contract. And then we return back the values and say it was a success because it was successful. And that's the receive logic needed for this. Uh, the next sections are not as important for this. It's kind of like the instantiate where we don't need to set any specific data. Uh, we just need to return back that we did call that, it was okay, and that we did uh, call timeout, and if something happens, we don't need to do anything. Uh, the user can just resubmit a transaction later. There's no extra logic that needed for the name service. Once all of that is implemented, that is the contract for the entire name service. You can run the cargo run script optimize in your terminal, and this will take a minute as it downloads all the dependencies and compiles everything in Rust to a standard uh, WASM contract, which is the COSM WASM contract here. So that's going to compile. Um, I'll give that a minute for folks. Were there any questions in terms of the IBC implementation here, uh, the contract, how Cosmosm works, anything uh, generalized or specific to this? No? Awesome. Once that, that optimizes, it's going to take all of that code, it's going to optimize it into a very small uh, WASM format, and then it's going to give you this file that's going to be found in the artifacts in this name service contract. It also gives you a checksum so you can verify that this is uh, indeed that contract, and you can give that to others so they can also prove that out, that this source code is really that contract. And this is great for, say, permissioned networks like the Cosmos Hub. That way, as you upload it, everyone can verify that that source code is exactly what, was, what is, has been running and they can see that on their own machine. So we have the contract now, we have the chain, and the next step is to actually begin to start up this chain with itself. Um, well, actually, we only need to start one. Um, yeah, we'll just start the same chain with itself across two different ones and connect a relayer to that, and all of that is done through spawn and local interchain. We're gonna head back into the CW chain repository. You can continue to do this while your other contract compiles, um, but we're gonna move back into there. So I'm gonna open this up and open that in code. We're back into that CW chain that we were running before. If you didn't already, uh, make sure you have Highlander at this point. You should have installed this earlier. Sometimes people forget, so I added a note here. Make sure you have Highlander installed. If you don't run this command, the setup testnet will fail. That Highlander is not found. It will then automatically install it. And the next time you run setup testnet, it will then do it again. Uh, we'll work on increasing that developer experience there. Uh, setup testnet, we'll go over as I run this. To increase the um, throughput, we build the binary for your local machine. We then build the Docker image also at the same time. And then we're gonna add those keys back to you as the user in your key ring so you can interact with it as if it wasn't a testnet, as if it was your, your own uh, like public network. This is gonna go and I'll run through that in the make file. 
this verifies that, hey, local interchain is installed. We install that binary as mentioned. We run local image, which uses Highliner to build that up. We set the, the testnet configs where we specify that the client chain ID is chain one. Uh, we're going to use the test key ring. We don't want any passwords. We just want it to work kind of like an in-memory database. Uh, this is save, saved to the state. So through reboots, you will still have that. Don't put important mnemonics in this. Make sure you only put test uh, test ones that you're okay with losing. They should not have any funds on them. And then we just set that the, we want the output to be text. You can also use JSON if you want to do some parsing. The Docker image does take a minute, so I'm going to continue to let that sit. Uh, other things with Spawn is that we automatically have chain registry integrations. So once you have a network, imagine like You've spent a bunch of time working on contracts. You're ready to launch this network because you want to make it up to public. All of this can just be copy pasted over into the chain registry. And then you get support for wallets, um, other explorers like ping.pub. And all of that information is given to you at the start of this. Uh, if you use something like Forge uh, for ICS networks, which was a previous tutorial from yesterday that we did with Informal, this gives it to you as well. That way you can launch a permissionless network using ICS. It's just all right there. You don't have to know the format. You just fill in the blanks and we handle the hard part for you. We go. So it's continuing to build up that Docker image. It's now set it. And we've, we see here that the errors, this is because we already, I already have the key. You won't see this error because you don't have the key yet. Um, I'm working on also increasing this where we just ignore this. That way it doesn't scare users. But all of the testnet is set up. We have this CW chain. It is called local because we're building it locally. We don't expect others externally to run this. And so now we have it. And now it's time to run this itself. We're going to use the local interchain command and start it with self IBC. Where we get self IBC from, local interchain looks for the chains directory where you're running this and it finds this self IBC.json and that's what we're running here. You can also use a. If you look here, you can see other gist where you can actually upload this remotely. That way others on your team can have the same configuration as you, and you can share this through either Pastebin or gist or through a, a GitHub raw link. And this is just the standard same, same JSON. And if you ran this uh, locally, you don't need any configs. You just need local interchain installed. And you have this now very complex config that you didn't have to copy paste and get out of date with maybe your, your upstream GitHub repo. We're going to start running the self IBC using the start self IBC command. And you can specify other things like where do you want the public API port to be? Where do you want the host to be? Maybe you only want it local host, maybe you want it public. Uh, and this is running local interchain uh, test under the hood. And it's going through everything of setting up a network. We're starting all of the accounts. We're starting uh, the validators. We're creating new validators. We're um, going through the Gen TXs. So we're doing all of these complex topics and to you, you're just starting a chain and we abstract all of that away from you. As mentioned in the self IBC, we specify that we want local chain one to connect to local chain two. If we go back up here, uh, local chain one, we want to connect to local chain two. And right now the relayer is setting those up and the relayer is linking local chain one and two off of a basic transfer port. This is the ICS 20 spec. Uh, we're just going to create something just to prove, yes, the relayer is up and then we can reuse that for, for the, the next connections. Uh, here, if you run into Docker PS, you can actually see that running here and we'll run into the container ID and then do docker logs dash F to follow. And we can follow the logs as it's querying blocks with the go relayer and everything that it's done to connect this up. If you have issues, you can go through here and it will specify what the reason was that there was a problem. Local interchain exposes this port. This is by default on 8080. You can open this up in your browser and get useful information like what is the chain registry? So that way, if you run a web app with this, which we also have support for, then you can just grab this data directly from the API, hot reload it as you, as you refresh, and then go in. Um, we have the same for assets. 
We have where you can upload contracts. This includes Cosmosm and Solidity if you're using the EVM instance of local interchain and you can upload those easily. It'll just allow you that. We're not going to use that directly in this tutorial. We're going to do it through the binary itself, but it is an option if you so choose. There's also info. This is, again, useful for a web app, and uh, we give you all of the basic data, like where's the RPC address of that node that is running. We can come here. It's a standard Cosmos node. Here's that ABCI info from the Tendermint client. Well, comment BFT now. Uh, same case for, for the REST endpoint. You can have REST endpoints that you can find in the proto, but that's out of scope for this. Chain 2 is the same case, except we randomized ports. We found one on the user's machine that's OK. And it's the same format because, again, it is the same chain. It's just a different chain ID. We also show what IBC channels are open. That way, your front end can easily parse this. We grab this directly from, I believe, the read layer. And it just specifies some useful information. That way, you can either index this or run something against it to prove uh, that this, this is indeed open across multiple different chains. And then we actually show what the, the raw chains format was that was from that config to the user as well. In case something is happening where a you find a problem, we make sure that, that you can debug that without having to have access to that, that file directly. And then we specify what is the relayer here. All of this is done behind the scenes so the user doesn't have to set this up. We just do it for you and we set the block history to 100. going to head back to the tutorial now. Now that the testnet's built up, everything's done locally, and local interchain is, is started, we're going to use that data, what we just saw in info, to just grab these RPCs. Uh, you could also just hard code these uh, directly for this. You're also able to just grab. So we're going to clear out this and paste that in. And so we're using RPC1, which is the main network that's on the 26657 that we looked at, and then the other randomized port, which is chain 2. It's the same chain, just a different uh, ID and network is on that port. And we just set those to, to these environment variables so we can reuse them. The contract source, as shown earlier, is in this WASM file. So we're going to specify that, and we're going to upload that using the WASM store command to both chain ID 1, so RPC 1, and the other chain, which is chain ID 2. We need to upload it to both. That way we can, can talk to them uh, together. And then there's other helper commands there that you can verify once it's uploaded. So we're going to paste this in. Now it's uploaded to both. You can query these to, to verify it, or we can just query against the WASM list code directly. And we see there is, I've created a data hash, which is the, the contract, and it is ID 1. And that's, that's the case on both chains. It'll be the same, the same value in both instances. We now need to instantiate a new contract on both sides. So we have the source code, but we need an instance of it that we can actually interact with. We're going to use the instantiate. There's no data that we need to pass in. We don't need to set an admin. We're going to name it NS1. You could also put any, any name for this label. And we're going to run that on both for chain one and chain two. Copy that and paste that in. And now it's up on both of the networks. Uh, we're going to verify that there is a contract actually up there on just chain one. Let's grab that. We're just going to list the contracts by this creator, which is what the, the default account is. And we used account zero, which is found in that self IBC file. And there is that contract. And we're going to now set that to an environment variable because we have it and we just want to make our lives easier. So use this name service contract and we're going to set it to that value. Now that we have both of the contracts set up, the next step is to get the relayer connected. We're going to use the relayer connect here, and we're going to download this bash helper. There's also a way to do this in local interchain. Other ones showcase that. Uh, for this, we, we use this bash script. You can use either one. Uh, I believe we may use it later in this as well. So you just download this. This source is available in the interchain test uh, local source repository. We save it to a file, and then we're going to source it, which allows us to access those functions. It's a very small file. Uh, if we go open it up, and it's just these bash functions for, hey, I want to make a request. I want to query. I want to do a binary execute. And under the hood, it just does post request, uh, as you can see here, via curl into the instance. 
We are going to run the ICT relayer exec against this API using local chain one. And then it's going to call the relayer to link local chain one and chain two, which we found in the self ibc.json with a port from one contract it needs to be the WASM. And then what is that WASM contract? The destination is going to be the same. We want it unordered and we want it on this version. We're going to take that and run that in the terminal. And this will hang. This will take a minute as the relayer links. I'll go look at an instance of this so you can watch it live. Um, it's linking these together. We will connect this. So the relayer is actively running behind the scenes, abstracting it from you and connecting this on both sides and doing the handshakes, verifying the data, passing it, ensuring everything is okay, that the contract logic is good, who's paying fees, what is happening, updating it, all of that's happening here. And the user doesn't have to know about it unless you decide to go in and check for it. With that, the context canceled, so it's, it's been done. If we run back Docker PS, we just have the normal relayer start, which has been running, which is going to pass these packets for us. We can also just hard flush. Let's verify that the channels are actually indeed opened after we created that. So we, in the, the, the roll D command, which is what the, the chain name is, we're gonna query the IBC module. We're gonna check the channel and we're gonna check for what channels are available. By default, channel zero was already created for us as we spun up local interchain. And then channel one is that one that we just created, which has the other port ID, which is the WASM contracts on both our side and the counterparty other side. Its version is NS1 for the name service one. And uh, we can see where the height is, the revisions, and the, the latest values for this and ensure that it's updated. We're going to use the relayer exec function, and we're going to also query the channels here. You can do it either way. It showcases that you can do it multiple ways um, if you source it, which we did in the other area here. And now you can parse this easier through JSON. OK. We have everything set up, the relayer set up, the chains are both set up. Now we can actually run a set name function and have that be done via IBC. We run set name, we're going to specify the channel, that was channel one. We can see that here um, in the, the previous data, which was back here. Hey, here's channel one, that's, that's who we're, we're targeting. And we're going to set a name that just says my name. We send that from the normal account and we're doing this on chain zero. So we're going to run that, and that's there. We can verify it with a well, D query transaction. And you can see the data that is sent through and make sure that everything looks good. There's no errors here. We're good. So that packet was generated, uh, and now, now it's being sent off by the relayer and being relayed. If, for some reason, the relayer was not fast enough, which it will be for locally, you can just run this TX flush command, and that's going to flush the packet through to just verify, like, hey, are there anything, is there anything pending? Uh, if not, then we're good. In this case or not, the relayer's already handled it, so the packet has been sent from contract one over now to contract two. Now we need to verify that the, the contract uh, data was actually submitted. So we know that the packet's been sent through. Uh, we've, we've verified that the channels are open was the name actually set? We can do that by querying uh, using the wasm state smart query command. And we're gonna do that on RPC2. Let me type this in. Okay. We call that contract. We're gonna specify, I wanna get name. This is using that get name method that we specified in the messages. We want the name on channel one, and we want this wallet who set this. This is uh, the account zero wallet. You can also find that if you do We'll do keys show, and then we show account zero. That is that account. And then we specified node two because we want to see, we created the packet on chain one. I want to verify that the data on chain two matches what I expect from setting it on chain one. Whenever we ran that, we did get that. It specifies here, the data says my name, which is what we set from chain one as the user. We can also verify all of the state if you would like. You can look at the real deep implementations uh, from the state. This gives you that raw base64, which you could then go into somewhere like base64 decode. You could paste that in, decode it, and we can see what does that format look like actually in the WASM contract. It's the user's name, and they specified my name as it. That is where the store is. As you add more data, this will, this will change based off of the keys. So in summary, what have we done? 
we launched a new cos Cosmosm contract. We set up a new chain. We connected these via IBC. We then implemented the IBC in the contract and we connected um, everything together. We sent packets, we queried data, we verified it uh, all in the span of less than, oh, actually right on an hour. Um, so yeah, that's how you create an IBC application in Cosmosm. And we'll head here. Um, if you want to know more, you can check us out at Strange Love, uh, also at Strange Love Labs on Twitter. The spawn tool is found here. And a reminder that Hackmos 2024 is coming up uh, this, this weekend. Uh, spawn is a great resource to be using if you want to build up a new chain and uh, work on contracts and things like that. We have other tutorials within the spawn uh, documentation here where there's other things like building a normal name service, building this name service, yeah, building the name service module is IBC. There's application demos um, for like normal IBC transfers, doing Cosmwasm NFTs, how to interact with Token Factory, Cosmwasm validator reviews, which is actually submitting data from a Cosmwasm like, or from an SDK chain and passing that over into a Cosmwasm contract. There have been lots that want to get some state and verify that on, on the Cosmwasm side. Now you'd be able to do that. Uh, and then there's also a new learn section that is that is uh, starting, which gives things like, uh, I need to, to select a consensus, like what is proof of stake? Why would I want proof of stake? Or why would I want interchain security? And this goes through all of those things. Uh, we'll be working a lot on the developer experience here and solving those sorts of issues. And I'll pull back up this. If we would like, do we have time? I can run through this process in in native, where I will sh I won't I will be going very fast. Um, but I will showcase how to do this in the SDK and everything that comes with that. And redoing this in yeah the the SDK and not Cosmos. Has everyone? Questions. Yes, we'll do questions first. Um, yeah, and that way you can scan that and have time questions for the Cosmosm implementation or anything Cosmosm in general. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I think that until now we have been looking at uh, how we are supposed to act when everything is good, but uh, I'm just curious how uh, we should act when it comes to uh, when we have a, we, when we don't have a IBC acknowledgement like when we have a error, like something felt on the remote chain. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, how are we supposed to debug this? Yeah, uh, the, the errors should be relatively straightforward in terms of, hey, your chain, like chain two is not started, for example, uh, something like that. Other things, it'll say like, it'll return back like name, uh, name service not able to access or something like that. Like you forgot to, to set the values. It should be straight, fairly straightforward in terms of something is wrong on the contract level. The likelihood that it's something wrong, like during the IBC packet send, is is very rare in this uh, local development scenario. You'll normally run that into that in production as other people are running networks and things. Uh, locally, though, a majority of it should be again fairly straightforward. For if there's an issue, it'll tell you in the the logs directly. It'll panic in some way. You'll see it. You'll kind of get an idea of oh that that does make sense if you have some understanding of Rust. Um, it should be yeah relatively simple to. I assume I should uh, take a look at the relayer logs or what? Uh, yeah, the relayer logs will will specify if we head back over to within here. It's going. It'll show errors as well if something does go wrong. You'll see it within local interchain. Uh, if you look into Docker PS and we do a Docker logs dash. Oh, it's not def dash f it. That piece of choice. The relayer will also specify things if things go wrong. By default, it's just a bunch of query spam usually. Um, yeah, like you can see things like, hey, context canceled. Like you would see an error in here that some issue happened. It'll specify what that issue was, and then you can debug it further from there on, on your side. I think it's uh, actually a good use case why you should always have your own relayers for your project because your will be always uh, it will always be available for you to look at the errors that you could get 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and we're working on that with Spawn where we want to have a front end. Well, we're going to have a full front end for Spawn. Part of that is going to be running your own relayers where you can just launch a test net through us. We'll connect it over to Osmosis or to Cosmos Hub. And then that way you can just have your relayer instance and you can verify that data yourself. And you don't actually have to run the relayer. Like you don't have to run this process or a Docker instance. You can just say start relayer to Osmosis and we're going to handle all that for you. So the infrastructure is getting there where it'll be super simple to do, super simple to debug. And we'll write more tutorials on different edge cases that are kind of common um, to, to resolve issues that may come up. Well, I, I mean, just it's sometimes it's uh, it's uh, it's hard to find the appropriate transaction on the relayer uh, on the relayer history transaction history, and uh, yeah, just I, I think you, you should be uh, you should like um, you should always try you should spend a lot of time to look up the transaction the the right transaction that uh, caused the error. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions in the back? Yeah, thanks for your work. It's really impressive. And uh, I just had a uh, silly question. I lost the part when we generate uh, Rust code in your docs, cargo generate and where Yes, where OK. Yeah. Um, we will head back over to that. Where is that end? Yeah, in the cargo generate, what what's happening is there is a template. Imagine as a... Just like there are variables in there that are not compilable and it's going to do it based off of, say like the name, the contract name, uh, we have a variable within the template repo. We'll go look at that now, which is what, what we're needing to override. Like if you directly cloned this repo, it would not work because it's not compilable. We're going to head over into the message. Let me also zoom in. And you can see like these things with like percents. Uh, that is not traditional Rust syntax. What Cargo Generate does is it's going to find wherever that endpoints is set within the Cargo Generate against this, and it's going to replace it with the valid code um, here. Because some things like we're using this as a minimal repo, so some of this stuff is like removed. Like for us, the instantiate message, we have nothing in there because there's nothing for us to set. And so these just allow us like, hey, unless minimal. So it's just this other more programmatic logic that is being written in as this template and cargo generate just removes all that for you that way that you're able to do that does that answer your question yeah so it just it gives you a good a good repo starting point any others once twice okay very quickly, I'm going to run this through this, but using the standard name service uh, example. Uh, this is going to do exactly what we just did with the Cosmosm side, but now on the SDK. There's other complex things like protobuf and protogen and running other like test nets. We're just going to go through it really quickly, just so you can show see how this this works. Uh, we go through. We also have a video walkthrough. Um, that me and Ollie did, and it goes through all of this. So if you want to read through the tutorial or you want to watch it again, you can always watch it here on the Interchain YouTube channel. All right, let's head over here. Let's exit out. Let's stop local Interchain. And instances are good now. Uh, let's close that too. Okay, we're going to use Spawn. We're going to create a new thing called Roll Chain, Proof of Stake. We're not going to use Cosmosm for this. We don't need it, so we'll disable it. Uh, we're going to use these other values here. Yeah, let's clone that. And I will head into the terminal, head over to the desktop, and then paste that in. This is, again, building a chain very quickly. This time, it's going to install the Explorer. This will get cloned the latest. And just like that, we have the chain. We're going to then open this up into World Chain in our VS Code instance, and then head back to the docs. Uh, with Spawn, we have a module command. This creates a new name service. You can put anything you want instead of name service. This gives you all of the scaffolding that you need for this. Um, in the future, in a, a very quick minute, we're going to go through also creating a module that is an IBC module, not just a standard logic module. So we head over into the World Chain's directory, and then we're going to run this Spawn module new command. We're in role chain. We're going to run that. And just like that, our module is fully created and all of it is connected for us here that you can see in the Git repository. And we'll just add that like that. Okay. We have this instance and we now need to run this make protogen. This is just going to take 
these proto files uh, as you develop modules. It's kind of like the scaffolding or schema for creating um, how the interaction is, how the state should 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 be formatted as, and that's done here in the transactions. For transactions, by default, we give you, hey, update parameters, and there's just like very basic parameters. Uh, for state, if you want like an ORM, kind of like an SQL database, you can actually have that in Cosm in the Cosmos SDK too. We have that by default, and we test all of these things uh, in as you generate the, the the new base template. Further, we connect this into your app, so your application has a thing. If we go search name service, it's automatically connected for us here with all of that base logic and set up through your application, and we generate for anyone that uses the new V2 functionality. Um, these are more advanced developers at the moment. We generate all of those APIs for you for this name service so you can use things like dependency injection. We run the make proto gen command. If you have issues, you run the go mod to clean. Um, but now we're going to head on to setting the structure. Uh, as we're running this transaction, we're going to set the name service name. And that name is going to be from some sender, uh, the sender here. And they're going to set some name, which they can set to arbitrarily anything. And if there's any response, we just return nothing because we don't care about that. We're going to copy that in. And that's going to happen in the tx.proto. We'll head over into the proto file, name service v1, tx.proto. And you find this message service, you find the last one, delete that, paste, and you're good to go. It just puts it in and formats it nicely. We now need to do this for actually getting the name. So we have a resolve name function. This also has a REST API, which you can then validate through this endpoint and the wallet. And we have, what is the request for? Well, it's for, the, for this wallet. And what do we resolve the name to? And we'll set this from the application state. So we'll copy paste this into the query.proto under the params there. And now we're going to make protogen again. And this is going to take those proto schema files into the proper types. Open up a terminal instance, make protogen. And this will go through that. It's going to generate those, those protobuf files. And then it's also, uh, within spawn, we have this thing that takes those proto files and inputs it into your code, where you have to, to specify these interfaces. You need to, if I expect the, I expect this service query to have both params and resolve name. If it doesn't have resolve name, then it's not this service query. And what Spawn does is it, it's smart enough to understand, hey, we don't have that, that new resolve name. We, we only had params before. We need to add that resolve name. And that's what it does here, where it finds those stubs and it inputs that into our files directly. So if we head over into the query server, We'll have, okay, here's the basic params this was given to us, and here's that resolve name with our custom types automatically imported and a base panic that just allows us to begin to start writing our custom logic that we actually care about. Now, we're going to start writing out the, the application logic within the Keeper. The Keeper is like a singleton instance in the SDK. It's just where all of this data is going to be stored. It is where we're going to interact with the business logic. All of that is done here. We're going to head over into the Keeper and add this name mapping. So head over into Keeper.go. And in this Keeper struct, which is a structure that's going to hold it, we can just paste anywhere. This name mapping collection, a collection is just a map uh, that's used in the SDK. And hey, we're having a string to another string, a wallet to, an app, to a name. We need to set this up. So we're going to use the in the Keeper. Whenever we create a new keeper, we go down here and just paste anywhere this. This is just going to create a new map instance. Uh, we set this prefix as one. You can set this to any value. Uh, and then we call it name mapping. And the string is a key. And the value is a, is a, a string as well. There's also images for you. That way, if you are confused where to paste it exactly, we specify that here. Now we write the actual logic. In the message server, as a transaction comes in, we need to set this to state. So we're gonna call this name mapping. We're gonna set from the sender to what they expect their name to be. If there's any errors, we handle it. And then in response, we just return nothing because it was successful. We're gonna copy that and head over into the message server. We 
automatically have this set service name, so we only have to comment what exactly we want to change, and that's the, the specific logic. We're going to do the same for the query server. We need to grab from the name mapping. We're going to get that, and we're going to return a response, but this time we have data to respond with because the user requested it, so we're going to turn that name, which is V, which is, stands for value. We're going to head over to resolve name in the query server, and now that logic's set. Now we just need to configure the client. All of the application logic for doing the name service is done, but how does the user actually interact with that? We use auto CLI, which is a very simplified CLI interface, um, part of the, the new V2. And uh, we're gonna specify resolve name. This is the RPC method, which you can find back in the proto files uh, up here, like set service name, for example. Um, well, that's resolve name. The other one is set service name here. So you just specify that and you specify what is the format and what are those fields? And we just paste that in. So for the query, we're doing resolve name. This is in auto CLI. Line 13, you just press enter, paste that in. And in the same case for the transaction, hey, set service name, we need to do that. We'll go do that here. Now it's time for testnet. Let's verify it. We can go to make sh testnet, launch an instance. This is going to build up that binary, install it with all of our custom logic that we just did. Make sure that the auto CLL client um, has the, the values that we, we need to be able to set, to set our name on this local instance. And then we'll be able to verify it with that query method. Notice here, we don't need any relayers. This does not have IBC support yet. We're going to open up a new instance. I'm going to set from uh, set my name to Alice from account one, and I press yes. We get that transaction, and then we can verify it. Sometimes it's not the same value. In this case, it is for the transaction hash, and we will press enter, and we can see, hey, there's no errors. Everything that we decided to set works. Let's actually resolve that name. Here's that account name, and we'll run that, and we get the name Alice and JSON. Um, you can query either directly. You can put in the input. Or you can use the roll D key show command and you can just do that that way that's more dynamic versus being a statically typed address. Uh, once you're done, you can just kill that instance. We verified that this works. Now, very quickly, we're going to go to part two. There's also bonuses here. Uh, I will add, they give hints of what, no, here's the problem. Here's a hint that should help you get on the right track. And here's the direct solution for that. Um, and we have two of those here. This one has multiple different uh, solution architectures here to help you out. Uh, we're going to quickly go into the actual IBC method. So we have this, this name service module. We're now going to create a new module that is for the name service IBC specific logic. And we, while this is not the most optimal solution, ideally you could put all of this into one. We wanted to showcase, hey, I have another module that has logic. How do I implement that into some IBC module? I want to extend that functionality without having to rewrite it. And that's what this is going to showcase. We're going to use the spawn module new command. It's going to be called the NSIBC for name service. And we just passed this flag. I want an IBC module. Within here, I just run that. And like that, we have an IBC module. This is very similar to the normal module, except that it has the IBC specific logic, which we'll be modifying in just a minute. Uh, a lot of the boilerplate that we did in Cosmwasm is already done for us, or that we had to build custom in Cosmosm is already done for us. We just have to write the application logic. So this is one of the simpler approaches at the moment. In the future, when we have the Cosmosm template with IBC, that will be resolved and be just as easy as, as you're about to see. Uh, and then we make protogen just to verify that, that everything is good with the new module that we generated. Now we're gonna reference in the name service IBC module, we need to reference that other module that we've done, uh, that we just created, that name service there. So we're gonna grab that keeper, which is where all that data is stored, and we're going to pull in that import, and then we're going to use that within the keeper itself and pass reference to it. There. So now this is that other file, we can look into this. This is what we just did a second ago. There's that collection map. So now we have access to be able to modify it as, as we need and grab data. We need to set up this to be where the application actually knows to give reference to it. Like we, we need that data. The application needs to allow us to set it. 
So we're going to go into the new keeper and on the last line, we're just going to say, hey, we want to input that. And now we're going to set that in our keeper so the instance can use it in the keeper at the very end. And now we have it. So now the application is going to be able to pass it and we'll do that in just a second. Um, here. There's this new keeper method that is found in the app.go. This is where everything is set up and we just need to specify, hey, here's that name service keeper. So we're going to head over into the app.go. This is found in the app directory. You can see the, the, the red, it's not very happy. We're going to go make it happy by going down here. Doesn't have enough arguments. We add that line as expected. Now it has reference to the name service. Name service is created elsewhere. If we go to here, uh, the name service is created here, and that's where all of that logic is. That's why this is a reference, but that gets into more technical Go related things. Uh, now we need to set a name on the IBC packet. Within the NS IBC module, there's this, this IBC module.go. Within the IBC module.go, we have this handle on receive logic. Everything else for the IBC packets by default is set up for you um, that we went through Cosmosm. All we have to implement is how do we want to handle a packet that comes in? Well, by default, we have this uh, example store and we're going to modify it to say, hey, if the sum data, which is a default that we give in creating this IBC module is longer than 32, which in this case is the name, uh, return an error. You're not allowed to have a name longer than 32. This is just arbitrary. Uh, and then if that is not the case, then we're going to grab the name mapping from that other uh, module and we're going to set the data on it directly. <sighs> Copy this and the handle on receive logic. And now we have IBC support for the name service. So we're ready to start up the testnet. We're going to make install. And this is going to build up that binary. And then we're also going to run the make setup testnet. This is going to allow us the ability to do this through local interchain. Does it make we have the role D if we do transaction and then we do NSIBC. We can see that there's an example transaction that's already given to us out of the, the box with, with this generation. And we can also verify that, hey, does it have queries? We can do that through the name service, which is the previous tutorial. And yes, we can resolve a name from this. So we're going to set this from chain one. We're then going to have that packet be sent over to chain two. And we can verify on chain two after it's been relayed that the name was set through the Cosmos SDK and IBC. As mentioned earlier, we went through the importing of this, this bash script, which isn't as pretty. This tutorial uses local interchain directly through the binary, uh, which is a prettier format, but we want to showcase both ways, which is why we did that. Because that was part three, that was the end of, of the series, which is why we showed it the harder way. For this, we'll use local inter, uh, IC, and we're just going to call like interact on these things to then run these relayer transactions to connect uh, the, the different ports and connections. The Docker is still downloading for that. I will ask, are there any questions on the SDK implementation at the moment compared to the Cosmwasm implementation? Uh, I prefer the Cosmos SDK side, but I'm also biased because I like Go more at the moment than I do Rust. Yeah, at the moment, I do switch back and forth sometimes depending on what it is, but I prefer Go, plus I wrote Spawn, so I do like using my own tools for that. Okay, uh, the everything was set up. It does show error because again, I already have these keys as I mentioned earlier. So we're, we're good to go and this has been all created up. We're going to then start up the self IBC. It's the same as, as before. Uh, whenever we created the CW chain, it's going to launch local interchain, interchain tests under the hood and generate all of the files and, and things for us that we don't have to deal with uh, for both networks. We'll open up a new tab and we're not going to use the, the source directly. We're going to use the interact command as mentioned and then we're gonna use a function called get channels which we can also call through interact just to verify that you could also just run the relay transaction command. 
it's now creating the I, the ICS20 connection between these two networks just to verify that that does indeed work, and then we can continue on from that. You verify it within Docker PS, and you can query those logs like so. And you can go through, and if there are any errors, you can go through and check those. It also includes the transaction hashes where you can verify that, hey, there was an error, here's that transaction, and go look into it deeper. The API is now running, it's the same one as before. It has all the info. We have two chains, the one on the default port, and then the other one on the randomized port. We're ready to start the interaction using the relayer. We're going to connect both of the chains. And this time we're using the NS IBC one. That is what we call the module. So that is what it is by default. You can change that within the types here of the NS IBC. There is a keys.go. If you change this NS IBC to something else or you directly modified this version, you would change that because that is what we called it. We're just calling it based off of the module name. You do have to be careful about not calling your module something like IBC, say you can't call it like IBC NS because the SDK is going to think there may be a, a namespace conflict. And so it is picky about that, which is why we named it this versus something like just IBC namespace. Uh, and it will tell you like, hey, you should like rename this to something else. Okay, the relayer has now been connected between both of these. Let's verify that by getting the channels. We have multiple channels. There is a channel zero, and then there's also now this channel one, which we would not have had before, and that is NSIBC. Now let's run a transaction on that module. We're using the example transaction. Uh, we're going to run this on channel one, and we're gonna set test name on the chain one. This, yeah, I'm almost done, yeah, I'll be fast. Uh, we ran that, it generated that packet. We can then query that packet. Um, or we can just interact on chain two and query that we want to use the name service. We want to resolve that other name there and we can verify that, hey, was that packet sent? And indeed it was. So we set it on chain one. It was already passed over by the relayer behind the scenes without any interaction from us. We verified then on the second chain, yes, there was test name. And with this, we built, we built out a name service module. We then extended it with the IBC module that we generated, we set up everything with local interchain the same way as we did for Cosm Wasm. It's just a different implementation aspect. And so that is how you also do it in uh, the SDK as compared to Cosm Wasm. Thank you.